welcome to the fifth year of Advertising Week Europe. Wonderful to see such a full room because I know there's all sorts of wonderful things going on in the other rooms. So thank you for making the time this morning. And welcome to Risky Business, the art of reinvention. The first of two very special sessions that we're going to bring you from the Lighthouse Company this week. We hope we might see you at both. My name's Kathleen Saxton. I'm the founder of the Lighthouse Company, executive search firm in the media industry, and also the co-founder of Psyched, which is specialising in transformational leadership programmes for our industry too. We also have a psyched session this afternoon in this room at three o'clock talking about mental manifestos. What's our sort of manifesto for mental health? We've got Oliver James, psychologist, myself, and a guy called Hussein Manawir, who's the youngest Muslim who will go into space, who's also a mental campaigner for the millennial uh, era. So I hope you might be able to join us that for three o'clock. But for now, we have an amazing session this morning. Earlier this year, in our annual New Work Talent Survey that we undertake every year for 600 sweet, sweet leaders, we asked them, what it was about staying in the industry, what it was about leaving the industry, and 39% of respondents were considering leaving our industry, and 10% were considering actually selling their businesses and starting something afresh. And while these levels of transience can open doors for new talent to enter, the flip side is, of course, it represents a real danger for permanently losing some talent within our industry. But why was that? Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. It's long been cited that the average person will experience at least three different careers, not three different jobs, three different careers in their lifetime, three different paths to success, fulfillment, ultimately happiness, something I've encountered myself with a journey through sales and marketing and then headhunting and then my latest ventures in psychotherapy. It certainly keeps me mostly out of mischief. There are many varying personal professional factors that could drive such a fundamental life change and for each individual the shift can be very, very different. And it can be difficult too. Is it something that you grow into? Is it something that you've harboured desires for for quite some time? How do you make it work with your previous career? Do you use that as a pivot or a bridge to your true calling? Can you make the bold leap away from where you've been and just make the jump? How do you deal with the practicalities? The change in salary, the change in structure, the change in the general day to day, and how might our fragile egos cope with that change? Well, to find out, we've curated this fearless and fantastic panel. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our three exceptional guests, all of whom have altered the course of their careers in very, very different directions. First up is the wonderful Kate Thornton. Kate's career began in media at 19, where she wrote as an editorial assistant for the Sunday Mirror. Kate rose to the top with astounding speed, and just after three years, she was named as the youngest ever editor of Smash Hits. After a couple of years, Kate became her first career change into television, initially as presenter for Straight Up before starting another career in radio shortly afterwards. Kate is perhaps best known for being the first presenter of The X Factor for its first three whole seasons, but she's also a household name due to her stint for two years on, of course, Loose Women. At the start of 2016, Kate built upon her life in the public eye, opting to burst into the world of e-commerce with the launch of TV Scene, a content-driven shopping and cashback site targeted at women, representing her most recent career transition to date. Kate is also attending college to study counselling with a view to becoming a fully, fully qualified therapist, indicating yet another transformational change maybe to come in the near future. And if that isn't enough, Kate is just back, literally just back from Kerala, where she took part in a 187 mile bike ride to raise £50,000 for the charity Brain Tumor Research. We're not sure how she's actually got here <laughs> and whether or not she'll actually uh, challenge Laura Trott in the velodrome sometime soon. But we have heard, Kate, on your Instagram that life in the saddle is quite hard. Yeah. So just for you, Kate, from Lighthouse, we've got a special themed cushion <laughs> just for you to sit on during our session, which I'll pass down, but I'll throw it's to you. much Richard. needed. Thank you. You're very very welcome. Our My second panelist, <laughs> our second panelist, dramatic career change can be inferred just by his name. Originally a chorister, the Reverend Richard Coles' first spotlight career was as a multi-instrumentalist superstar in the legendary 80s pop duo The Communards, alongside Jimmy Somerville. Richard's change in direction first spouted in the year 1990s when he decided to study theology at King's College. Richard followed the church for the next decade and in 2005 he was officially ordained into the Church of England and Richard has walked this path to the present day where he currently works as Vicar as Finden in Northamptonshire. You may have spotted Richard on Have I Got News For You, QI or even the Big Picture Painting Challenge that she's currently hosting on BBC One with Mariella Frustrup. Welcome Richard. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Anna Jones, who many of you will have seen on this very stage over the past few years and is a hugely talented partner for Advertising Week Europe. Anna was recently shortlisted for Media Pioneer of the Year at the British Media Awards and in late 2016 won a Women in Marketing Award. She certainly has earned us her stripes in this industry. 
Until last month, Anna was the CEO of our biggest and most successful publishing operation, Hearst Magazines in the UK. Then she decided to make the entrepreneurial leap, launching not one, but two startups at the same time. Albright provides funding and support for UK's best female-led businesses, while StyleShare offers users to book personal sessions in lifestyle experts through the weekends, through the weeks, and making our lives a lot easier. I'm signing up. Incredibly exciting businesses with very bright futures. So three panelists, all of whom have made significant and daring changes in their careers. Without further ado, please join me with Richard, Kate, and Anna. Welcome. Thank you for making time, given you've got all these careers going on. <laughs> we wanted to start today with the question that we always ask at the Lighthouse when we meet anybody of any sort of uh, background, which is, what did you actually think you wanted to be when you were a kid? And Kate, if I can, I'd love to start with you. Um, a journalist from a really, really young age. And I still consider what I do to be um, a journalist. Yeah. I'm a storyteller. So yeah, and that's never changed. Age. Also, I was absolutely rubbish at everything else at school. The only thing I was good at was English. I just thought, play to your strengths. <laughs> Got you. Richard? I wanted to be the world's greatest composer or a shoe manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the shoe manufacturing come in? My dad was a shoe manufacturer. Okay. And that was the sort of uh, career which, uh, family business, so that was, um, that was up there too. Okay, and the musical side? My grandfather, who was a great, he was a pianist and a great entertainer. And I used, to, I used to sit at his feet and he'd play the piano and keep everyone around. And I realised later on that he was singing while drunk, smutty versions of George Formby songs. <laughs> but I didn't realise that I was, he was brilliant. In fact, he used to, the, the long bar at the Trocadero, this very building, was his hangout where he used to, he used to mentor. I can't talk about that. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure you oh, can. Go on, do. Well, he took a keen interest in the career of young women in show business, should we call it that? <laughs> <laughs> And the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Anna, what about you? Um, I think when I was really young, I wanted to be a singer or an actress. But unlike these two, I have absolutely no performing talent <laughs> whatsoever. So then I think I did pivot when I was a little bit older, thinking about I wanted to be a business person. I didn't know quite what. Mm. OK, so early ambitions for that. Tell me a little bit, did you guys ever have an early inkling towards the careers that you have gone on to do? So Kate, clearly with journalism, you followed that through going into mm. journalism very early on. So your instincts were, were quite right as a child. Yeah, but I, I recognised very early on that it was a really tough business to crack, especially when, you know, I'm from Cheltenham in Gloucestershire, so there's, there's very little media opportunity out there. So, and also my grades were really quite low average. So I knew that I had to find a way to get to where I wanted to go. So I got a job at my local paper, paying the paper boys, but it gave me a pay slip to take to the London Institute to apply for a really tough course to get onto in journalism. And I was able to say to them, you know, I work, I'm, I'm already writing, look, I've got a pay slip. <laughs> so I literally just blagged my way in. I couldn't even spell. <laughs> Still can't. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, you, you kind of, I, I don't know, for me I had a really, really sharp sense of what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and, I, and I was quite focused about it. Got you. So Richard, a chorister from a young age, but did that give you an inkling for career or just something that you enjoyed at the time? Well, in retrospect, of course, it was music and the church coming together, although it was only really the music I was interested in. I was lucky I had a, a good voice when I was a boy. We had a great chapel and great music thing at my school. And, uh, and of course, when you're young, you don't really know uh, how much you're learning, and especially if you're a chorister in the Anglican tradition, you have effectively a professional musical education while you're still in short trousers. As for the content, I was certain from the age of about eight that there was, it was quite clearly a fiction and a fairy tale. And I started the Wellington School Chapel Choir Atheists Club when I was eight years old. <laughs> Which is actually, in a way, also perhaps prefigures ordination in the Church of England, but there you go. <laughs> Very good. And Anna? Um, I think probably uh, where I've got to is a bit of a mashup of my childhood in some ways, because I'm the eldest of four daughters. Um, my mum is an artist, so I've always been very interested in creative people and creative talent. So I guess I've, I've worked with creatives most of my career and my grandparents were real academics. So I guess I had both sides um, of you know, those influences early, early on in my life. And I think just trying to sort of make a difference thinking as a feminist, um, you know, my mum, uh, I had to move schools when I was a child because my mum um, took on the school because girls weren't allowed to wear trousers. And so they, and they wouldn't back down. So in the end, I think my mum was in the PTA, was like, well, you know, I've fallen out with everybody. <laughs> and the headmaster, we're gonna have to move schools. So I think uh, maybe some of these influences around sort of making a difference and being a 
strident feminist have, uh, of course. impacted. So given all the careers that all of you had that were settled up until the change, was there a defining moment? Was there a moment, Kate, for you when TV scene was becoming a baby in your mind? Was there a point where you, w was it because you were fed up with what you were doing for any of you? Was there a pivotal moment or did you build to it slowly to change career? Definitely slowly. Okay. I don't think you can do something as, as big as set up a business, certainly the scale that ours was. It was a kind of go large or go home business. Um, and, and, it, and I spent years working it through before I even discussed it. So I had those kind of awkward conversations where people say, so what else are you up to at the moment? And you just go, oh, nothing. I look really lazy because I just thought I'm not ready to share this yet, mm -hmm. but was working day and night on trying to understand the foundations of the business, how it would work, um, and then how to, how to dress it, how to take it out to the world, how to make it walk and talk. So yeah, it was, it was very considered, which is very unlike me. I normally just go, yeah, go on then. Um, it was probably the least Im impetuous decision I've ever made. And why TV scene? What was it about that particular type of business or to invent um, that? Consumer frustration. Yeah. Um, I wanted I wanted a site that, that, that did a lot of heavy lifting for me. I was a full-time working single parent doing all of my shopping online late at night and having to trawl from here to there to everywhere. I wanted something that spoke to me, curated um, the brands that I wanted, bought me the best deals with all of the savings wrapped around it. So um, that, that was kind of the beginning really, was just a consumer frustration. And not really understanding how brilliant some of the rewards are um, in the online shopping space. And having these kind of light bulb moments of going, what, hang on a minute, so if I'm buying, I'm buying all this stuff, but if I just put one extra click in my journey, I can save literally over a thousand pounds a year. That's that's a holiday, you know. Like why would I not do that? Who wants to pay more than they knowingly have to? Um, you start to feel quite stupid for not doing it, and and then I just thought, right, start telling my girlfriends about it. They all got quite evangelical, and I just thought there's something here. But then I had to understand how to build it. Never built a website. How to market it. Um, and I had to make it not feel something that was horribly complicated, which had always stopped it resonating with women. So, yeah, That's so it's good. a very long answer. No, no, really no, helpful answer. Anna, for you and both of your businesses, so again, different areas, but I'd imagine, again, both gaps in the market. My chairman always says, is there a, is there a market in the gap? That's the <laughs> bit you got a question, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, you know, the, my influence is, I've actually wanted to be a, a, an entrepreneur for a long time, most of my career. In fact, I start, tried to start a business in my 20s. So I think I've sort of had this ticking around in the back of my mind um, for many years. But then I think things happen for a reason. So you learn from what you're doing and then you sort of build on that. And I think um, for ShareStyle, it was really about thinking, what's the move beyond product? So one of the things that I saw a lot at Hearst was people's desire for more than product. They wanted an experience um, so we started thinking about well what you know what does that mean beyond product actually it's really around the people behind um, you know the talent I guess behind the magazines and behind Instagram behind Pinterest and how do you actually buy into them so actually it's a very simple idea but I guess what I saw is all the trends around me in the media and as a consumer and thought there's a there's a big gap there and then I think for Albright, um, really, again, just looking at the data, um, sitting on panels like this, um, you know, as a female CEO, not enough of them, talking about why there are not as many female CEOs, um, talking about why women are not starting businesses to at the same um, level as, as men. And we realised there was a big funding gap. So we looked at the data and thought, you know, we need to do something about it. Got you. And Richard, for you, different story altogether for you. So. The height of the communards, tell us something about it. We're desperate to know. Well, if I could remember it, I'd be happy to tell you about <laughs> it. No, well, it was, it was, the, it was the, the middle of the 80s in an era when the record industry was particularly flush, partly because of the nature of the format. They could charge a big premium on that, partly because people were duplicating their record collections on CD. So it was a, it was a wash with money, really, and all the kind of stuff that goes with that. But it was also a time of activism, and we were a pop group that was very interested in activism. It was the era of Live Aid. And I think lots of what we got interested in was how you could use that kind of the dynamics of popular culture to switch people on to uh, ideas that they might not otherwise be encountering, and also to use it as a way of resourcing some activism around that. So HIV and AIDS hit middle uh, 85, 86, 87 for us. And so a lot of our energies then went into activism around that. And it was through that, really, that I started realizing that a lot of what we'd been doing had been uh, sort of out there, and that there was an internal deficit as a result of that. 
the kind of um, the dynamics of pop music were such you get caught up in that. It's like water skiing. You, you have to sort of stand up and hold on. And it's all directed out. And then I began to realize that there was a kind of internal reality that wasn't being fully acknowledged. And when I started to pay some attention to that, I found myself kind of actually having this strange nostalgia for what I'd felt in chapel when I was a chorister as a boy and something about the power of music to connect to profound needs within people and also interesting ways of answering those intractable questions. And that kind of led me gradually at first and then dramatically, sort of a conversion moment, into seeing a different sort of future open up. Mm. And lots of people always say, you know, how did you get from being a pop star to being a priest? And of course, when it's just your life, it's just your life. And it's when, when you try to explain it to people, you perhaps you see the anomalies in it more clearly. But what you really see then are the continuities, not just the discontinuities. Mm. Nobody, I think, radically changes their life from one thing to another with a full stop and a new sentence. You're always building on yeah. prior experience, it seems to me. And the more I do this now, the more I realise that it's... I'm, that, it's trying to bring forth, bear the fruits of the experience that goes right back to the beginning of my, one of my careers. Yeah, understood. On that point, though, that pivotal moment, what was the most terrifying part of that? So Richard actually started carrying on with you. What's the most terrifying point of sort of that jump off point, if you like? Well, I think for me, it was going from being in what was a sort of uh, a prominent pop band into joining an organisation which to lots of my friends would seem like the kind of enemy in a way and to lots of other people would seem to be the absolute antithesis of anything which had any appeal for people's attention or loyalty at all so it was that sense of having to kind of um, step off step off the yellow brick road I guess and take a much narrower and harder path into something and there were so many unknowns in it too and it involved such a radical rethink of life what I didn't realize and would highly recommend to anyone who's curious about these sort of things, is the extraordinary surge of energy you get when you actually make that change. And I, I found it quite easy to adapt to getting a lot less money and to not being my own boss in certain ways. And also to beginning uh, in a field on the bottom rung of a tall ladder. Daunting in some ways, but actually you do get an enormous release of energy when you do it, I found. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Kate, the same for you? Yeah, I would, I would completely agree with everything you've just said there. There's an you either feel the fear, you can, you can be fearful, or you can turn that into exhilaration. Yeah. And that for me was the same reason I went back to, to school and started studying again. I just needed to know if my head could do something new. Mm. I've been walking and talking and being uh, prob probably overly handsomely rewarded for it for so long. I just needed to know that there was other things in my toolbox up here. Mm. Um, and then once you start, I, I guess it's a trait you have as, as somebody that would do, s do the kind of things that we've done. I'm quite dogged. It's like, right, I've started now. And you start that climb and you don't look down. You just keep going up. And I, I, got, th I got excited by walking into a meeting and people having incredibly low expectations of me because I knew there was only one way to go with that and that was just to kind of raise the bar even slightly. If I could just not be, you know, as stupid as they thought I was, then I'd won. <laughs> um, and, and you start to, you know, and, so, and, and probably that was born out of my low self-esteem at that point. I just had a baby, I was a single parent, I was struggling and I was trying to find a way to make my work work with my life. And for the first time I wasn't living to work I had a bigger love in my life than my career and my son, and I was, I was trying to redress that balance. So there were lots of things fueling my fire, yeah. and I loved learning, and, and I am still fearful, and Anna and I were discussing this earlier. It's the most terrifying thing, being responsible for other people's livelihoods, much more frightening than anything I've done before. I've led a team at Smash Hits, I've been an editor, but ultimately, you know, payroll didn't start and stop with me. Yeah. And that really sharpens your decision-making. Um, I think cash flow for any new business is oh. always the thing that is most terrifying and needs to be most protected. And I think people often don't feel that until they're in the fire. It's like it, constant so. childbirth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anna, what about for you? The most terrifying part, obviously CEO of Hearst, gorgeousness in every way. What was it like to step away from yeah, that? I think, I think it, it was, um, you know, you have this idea in your mind, you've built up, ready to actually make the jump. And then you have that moment. The most terrifying thing was probably telling Hearst I was going to do it, actually, <laughs> yeah. because of my team and my boss. And, you know, I felt a certain sort of level of um, responsibility. You know, I actually had a very good friend and sort of mentor of mine saying to me, you can't do it. 
because you know it's important that there are beacons like you as a senior woman in the media so i had a kind of level of of guilt i guess around around that so once i had uh, done it and believe me i had to i practiced that little speech <laughs> 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 over and over and over is there a place that you practice these speeches by the way uh, well I, I was actually on holiday at the time and I, I actually remember doing the call this makes me sound like a complete loon from a walk-in wardrobe I actually put myself in the wardrobe <laughs> away from my <laughs> family so I could just get in the zone and kind of just you know when you when someone picks the phone in fact I said to my boss can I speak to you <laughs> and thinking he'll say yeah tomorrow the day after he was like I'm free now I'm like okay <laughs> so I sort of had to go lock myself in the room and just do the call you know just mm. do it quickly and then it's like ripping off a plaster but then of course you then get into that kind of exhilaration phase which I think um, takes over thank goodness. I would just say one thing as well um, I did find it much easier to make a radical change to my life because I had no mortgage and a decent pension also. I'll have to come on to that. All right yes. okay yeah. I think money is very interesting a lot of people that come and see us at Lighthouse who want to go and break away and do their own thing but are trying to figure out how they do that particularly if you've got to a stage in your life where you might have you know, some responsibility, whether it's dogs or children or whatever it may be, how do you do that? How do you take that leap when the financial stability of the family or yourselves is, is, in, is in jeopardy in that way? So tell us about that. Obviously, Richard, it's slightly different for you because you had, I'm guessing, had royalties to some degree. Yeah, although they dwindled dramatically fast, in fact. <laughs> um, not making records anymore did seem to affect my royalty stream. <laughs> um, but it, but it, 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 I, I, there was so much impetus behind the change that I was going to make that, in fact, adju the, the adjustment to uh, being poorer uh, w was, in fact, much easier than I thought. But then I had no dependents either. Yeah. And I did have also the security of knowing that because of the largesse of pop music, I did have a pension scheme that I thought I could rely on and no mortgage. And those just two very simple but powerful things uh, do give you an enormous feeling of, of security perhaps amid all that insecurity. Yeah, lucky you. But it, but it was, it was, the, 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 it was overwhelming the feeling of the necessity to change. I'm by nature quite a sort of timid person and quite a conservative person but I had to be neither of those things. Mm. But I knew that it had to be done in order to realise something that was coming into focus. Absolutely and I think lots of people that we meet are not living the life they really want to. They've almost flexed too far mm. from what they really wanted and you see it playing out in difficulties coming because they're not in flow. So knowing that you need to come back to or go to the place that's most important to you I think is something our generation is beginning to really understand. So, Anna, tell me about the terrifying thoughts for you financially. Um, I know you have two gorgeous children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to be realistic about that and people imagine that you just suddenly go, I'm going to do it and then off you go, you leave that kind of corporate job behind and jump into being an entrepreneur. And I um, was very aware that at some point I wanted to do this. So rather than create what I would call a gilded cage, which I see a lot of my mm -hmm. contemporaries and friends have done, is that basically they get the, they land the big job and then they live mm. to that. Yeah. You know, so, so they buy the big car, they buy another big house and they're basically spending all their money. Um, I was very conscious of that and so I paired right back and b made sure that I was living on a kind of lower means if you like for a certain amount of time so that I could buy myself effectively that kind of freedom to do it and allow myself enough runway um, that I could feel I could look my family in the eyes and, and, and maintain my responsibilities because you know it's all very well going oh yeah, I'm having all this funding this on this entrepreneurial journey and then my you know I've got to take my kids out of school or you know I can't afford to um, put food on the table whatever it may be so I think that's really important and actually it's something that not many people talk about mm -hmm. they, they just talk about the fact that oh yeah I just went and did this and realistically I think um, you do have to plan it properly if you don't want the unbelievable amount of stress that would happen where you're suddenly cutting your salary to I don't know, a quarter or less than you were on before. Absolutely. Kate, mm. for you I know there's been investment conversations as well as own personal revenue yeah. going in. I mean, so I, 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 my thinking is much like Anna's, you know, I, my career's, I've, I've had a really interesting run, um, but I've always paid myself a salary and built up a war chest because I always knew that I was in an incredibly fickle business mm -hmm. uh, where women of my age seem to just fall off a cliff, um, so in terms of their visibility. Um, 
you know, especially when I was trying to go out and find funding for my business, there were no women to talk to. Um, you know, I could have I could have done with Anna Jones about five years ago, really, <laughs> um, big time. So I'm I'm really thankful that other women will have your organisation to go and talk to. Um, so I I had done the same, I, and I worked for two years unpaid. Um, maybe even more actually on TV scene and invested my own money um, and pulled in every favour in my black book that I could um, to try to realise even if it had potential um, and then I, but I am lucky as well you know I can go and do a voiceover and it takes an hour or a TV show that doesn't eat an awful amount of my time I wasn't having to do it on top of a full-time gig um, but I definitely cut my salary definitely have lowered my earnings I've I, I, you know haven't earned as little as this for a long time, <laughs> but it's it's worth it. Get all day. Because I'm proud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get all day. I don't think they'd take me, Richard. You only have to look on my wiki page to see <laughs> that I'm not going to cut your cloth. Um, <laughs> those days are long gone. Um, so yeah, and, and I think you know you you're right, Anna. It's it seems vulgar to talk about money, but let's be honest. Yeah. I, I you know. I have been lucky, I have earned well and I've saved hard mm. um, and that has afforded me this opportunity to go up to somebody, you know, for somebody to come up to you now and say, I want to start a business, you should go, go for it, you know, yeah, it's easy, it's not, you need money, you need vision, you need faith in yourself, but most importantly, you know, bills don't pay themselves, you need cash in bank, yeah. Yeah. you do. The, 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 I was, before I was um, vicar of where I am now in Northamptonshire, I was vicar, uh, curate in the gritty inner city parish of Knightsbridge, London SW1. <laughs> wow. But it was very interesting talking to people there, particularly people who worked in the financial sector, who were living in the parish, who had made a pact to themselves, often bright kids at university, I'm going to go and work in the city, I'm going to make my fortune, and then I'm going to retire and do all the things I want to do. And they'd get to 40 or 45 and discover that they weren't the person they were when they left university. And that's another thing it's important to be realistic about, is that you will not be the same person in the middle years of your life as you were at the beginning. Absolutely yeah. so. Now talking about that and actually traits, for example, what are the traits that you feel you need to have to be able to make that leap into something new? And indeed, is there a trait that potentially binds you all together? Well, need I think for me I needed to change the way I work to be the mother I wanted to be yeah and there is no greater focus than the needs of your children um, so, so that was my big driver mm -hmm. and I'm I'm so risk averse I'm like you which I just I, I hate you know, I say you furiously I have since I was a child I've always had a piggy bank you know I've always been terribly scared um, and this is probably the most terrifying thing I've ever done and I've put myself out there and I'm still scared. I'm going to be really honest with you. Every month I'm scared um, that, you know, oh, is the business building? Are we doing okay? There's a horrible sense of pride that comes with it that's totally ego. Um, because actually, if I look back over the last three years, my greatest lessons have been my failings. Mm. Of course, often the way, isn't it? Yeah. I think facing those fears. Well, because when something important. works, you just go, brilliant, but look at this fire over here. Am I going to put that out? <laughs> um, and that's what you're there to do when, when, you're, when you're running a business. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's, it's no picnic, trust me. It's not even a buffet. Sometimes okay. it's just, <laughs> just hellish. <laughs> but um, once you neat. start, you, yeah, you, you can't, it's, it's, it's like you keep putting your hand back in the fire. Um, I don't know why, but I'm in it now. I'm not going back. So it's not the fires of hell. I'm sure Richard could help us with that case yes. if that were the case. <laughs> um, the Anna, you were nodding knowingly yeah, there. Yeah, no, I, I, well, I think what you're talking about is resilience. You know, you've got to be incredibly um, resilient. I also think you've got to be very optimistic. So, you know, very sort of positive yeah. and can do. And we were just chatting before, just talking about you can't look, or, or in my view, you shouldn't keep looking back. You've got to look forward. You probably disagree with that as a psychotherapist, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> keep looking forward. Um, and, and I think, you know, unbelievable hard work. You know, one of my old bosses that always used to say that phrase of, you know, uh, innovation is 99% perspiration one percent inspiration mm -hmm. not I think that that's what sometimes shocks really. me actually people that want to set their businesses up and aren't prepared to put in you know it yeah, doesn't well. have to shouldn't always have to be but actually the hard graft of working to the early hours not having resource doing everything yourself being really ready to do that if you are going to change I'm sure even for studying and other things Richard it's just different ways of expressing it but yeah. putting that amount of effort in that self brought if you like I think some discipline is really useful, actually. Yeah. Acquire the habits of discipline, acquire good habits. The enemy, I've often found, has been inertia. 
mm. more than anything really. It's just kind of lapsing into a kind of a whatever and not doing anything. So I need to be disciplined about that because sometimes all I want to do is watch Match of the Day too. <laughs> 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 And, uh, uh, mine say yes to the dress, that's my time, my <laughs> downtime. Say yes to the dress on repeat, I'll watch it over and over. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well, one, one trait that we've probably all got in common, um, and anybody that, that takes a leap of faith, no pun intended, um, mm. is being interested. Yeah. You know, in 1990 our world changed, the internet was born, and look what it's done to us. And I, th I would imagine that everybody sat in this room um, is connected in some way, to their working world, to the internet. and um, I've, you know, I've got friends, the mums at school, that you know, who I'm not going online. Like they're kind of defying it. It's like, well, you're missing out on a massive, not only conversation, but the you know, I've just come back from Kerala, and there's people in the backwaters of Kerala videoing us on their iPhones. We are connected in a way that we've never been before. And for me, um, I wanted to be part of a revolution. We might not have another in my lifetime. And, I, and it's shaken up what I do for a living. I'm fundamentally still doing the same job. It's just delivered in a different way. Yeah. And I love, I love that change. And some people kind of are scared by it, certainly in publishing. I know that lots of people just went, as, and telly as well, going la, 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 la. It's like, you can't do that. Embrace it, learn it, love it. Absolutely. So knowing what you all know now, what's the one thing you might have done differently as you embarked on the, the change journey, if you like? Bought shares in Microsoft and Apple. Apple, <laughs> definitely Apple. Uh, seriously, um, I think I would uh, um, to have found ways, which I've since learned, of using the kind of fear and anxiety that that sort of change produces as a kind of fuel, yeah. to use that as something to kind of propel you and energise you rather than thwart you. Yeah, wonderful. Anna? Um, I don't think there's anything particularly... I mean, I, I would say, oh, maybe I'd have done it before, but then I kind of feel like you know you, you you're there for a reason and the timing comes around for a reason so yeah. I, I think I, I, there's not something one thing that springs to mind um, I don't know that I could have done anything to up until this point in my career everything had happened to me um, so in many ways this is the beginning for me in terms of doing something that I started that yeah. I you know everything else was just didn't find me didn't land in my lap because I really worked quite hard at to, to make those opportunities mm -hmm. sing and dance mm -hmm. um, but this yeah this this I don't know if I would have done it differently yeah I would okay. have I would have maybe hopefully found some easier routes to investment that's the biggest <laughs> ball ache sorry no it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand oh, those words a world of pain <laughs> it's a world of pain and also you know I, I think I would have I would have been a bit more ballsy and a bit less apologetic yeah. because um, we do fumble along apologising because you uh, you go from being part of a big squad to a s it's just you, yeah. and you, you you do lose some of your grit and chutzpah. Mm -hmm. So it's we're coming to time in a little bit, and I'd love to ask a couple of questions of the floor. So if you've got one, get them ready because we're going to go right to the wire on time. When will you know the three of you that you've succeeded in this particular career that you've just chosen or have been doing for a while? How will you know? I don't know that I do. I don't know what I do. I, I kind of I find that my it's a forward battle, and often you know you know things happen and you deal with them, and you don't always. So sometimes it feels like a struggle going forward. But I quite like that. I like to get up in the morning and feel I'm engaging with real challenges. It's when I look back at the year and think actually that was a good good year. Yeah. Okay. Probably then. I, in terms of I try not to have too Olympian a view of my own circumstances because <laughs> I'm nearly always <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Anna? I probably haven't got an Olympian view mm. because I'm very mission focused mm. so um, I guess for ShareStyle it's really around opening up a very opaque world so we have this thing around making people feel more joyful so people's world's a little bit more beautiful in a way that they just didn't think they could access before and then for Albright it's all around um, making the UK the best place in the world to be a female founder so you know I'll know my work is done if I can manage to pull that off. Absolutely. Kate for you quickly. Um, success, it feels like success right now because I'm in year two and we're growing month on month in a way that is, is beyond my wildest dreams a year ago. So baby steps, you know, yeah. last year I just wanted us to grow, this year yeah. we're growing. Ultimately, if next year we're washing our own face, that will feel like triumph 
with bells on right now. But then ask me next year what success looks like and it will have changed. I, I think it's a bit Maslow's hierarchy of need. Yeah. I, you know, at the moment I'm at food and shelter. Yeah. I'd like to quite get to self-actualization at some point, but all in good Hope time. Hope we can all help you in this room. I'm also quite old and tired, <laughs> if I'm really honest. <laughs> Just quickly, any questions in the floor? Anything you'd like to ask our wonderful three career changes? Holly, I can see in the middle over there. Hello. Hello. Um, you, you all have very fascinating stories, um, but you've spoken in the individual, and I'm curious as to whether there have been people around you or people in your lives who have enabled you to have the form of momentum and, and make the changes that you've, you've sought to. Absolutely. Yeah, you're only as good as the people that support you. And actually, sometimes you're only as good as the people that doubt you. I think as well, I, I think one of the reasons I do what I do now is because I saw other people make it look possible. And simply by doing what they were doing and being who they were, they seemed to do it without too great a loss of integrity or authenticity. And that expanded the imaginative world. And then I could see myself with other people doing that sort of thing too. It's sometimes just simply that. And for me, I'm, ha I'm very lucky. I've got an amazing co-founder. So that was a big catalyst for me. And, and having an incredibly supportive husband also helps. Any other questions? No? Well then, just quickly before we end, just to make sure that we are living and breathing our values, there is a wonderful man in the audience called Jamie McCluskey who has also just made his career change. He was running as commercial director at AOL and he's founded his own new snack company, which is actually called Love Corn, which is roasted corn. And on your way out today, he's going to give you a sample of that. So we're going to support him as he's making Best. his career change. So Jamie's is standing over there. Say hi to us, Jamie. So congratulations. Good to luck. You. Good luck. And can I just say thank you to Kate and to Richard and Anna for sharing our story, your stories with us today. Really, really grateful for your risky, risky business. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.